For the motion tonight, we have the main proposer, Baroness Thornton, who's the Shadow Equalities Minister in the House of Lords. And she's a Labour member and um, has a lifelong interest in the cooperative society, from what we can tell from the speaker notes. She's also a humanist, and uh, that's been properly declared, I think, um, on the speaker notes. She is seconded by Nick Tyrone, who is a senior officer in the Electoral Reform Society, having been previously treasurer of the Yes to Fairer Votes campaign. And he handles advocacy and liaison with the major parties um, in, in his current role. Against the motion, we have um, Lord Norton, who is a profile academic commentator on politics and constitutional affairs, taking a special interest in the strengthening of Parliament. I think I can say his day job is as Professor of Government at the University of Hull. And then we have the Right Reverend Dr. John Hind, who retired as Bishop of Chichester this year, having sat in the Lords for four years and being an extremely active contributor. Tonight I feel that I should warn you. There will be an attempt to seduce and beguile you by two very distinguished and expert beguilers. The noble Lord Lord Norton and the Right Reverend Prelate will, I expect, tell you of the uniqueness, attractiveness, workability, confection of expertise and wisdom that resides in their Lordship's house and is being made available to the nation for very little cost. They may explain that democracy is guarded and sheltered by the presence of the, of the House of Lords. But it, bear in mind, it is a parliamentary chamber that is appointed largely by patronage and which the established church has places of right. They may even say, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. I think with 800 odd peers and a rising number being still, still being appointed, we have a broken house and one which actually is in danger of being the laughing stock of the world. We are the largest second chamber by a very long way indeed. But I have to say that the devotion to public duty and presence of expertise in the Lords is undoubtedly true. And it has been a great privilege to be there for the last 14 years of my life amongst remarkable people whose sense of duty and to the nation is unquestionable. And it has also been a great privilege to be a legislator. I am a political anorak. I, come, I make no apology for that. So being a legislator, being a political junkie, I absolutely love the job that I do. But that's really no justification for the fact that there is a democratic deficit in our second changer, a chamber. And it's no justification of my continued existence to be the product of patronage in our legislature. When I went into the House 14 years ago at age 45, I have to say I did not expect to still be there today. When the Labour government removed the right of hereditary peers to sit in the Lords in 1999, it was described as phase one of Lords reform, and it was indeed very well overdue. Hundreds of hereditary peers left, who sat there by virtue of the bir their birth, mostly the sons of the fathers. But despite several abortive attempts, and the latest being the one that the coalition brought, which faltered, I am still waiting for phase two to happen. My own government failed lamentably, and so has the coalition government. And indeed, the last time I spoke in the House of Lords about House of Lords reform was 2007. And I said then that since 1997, in 10 years, we'd had a royal commission, two joint committee reports, four government white papers on Lords reform, and then I was speaking in the, in, uh, the Lord Steele's Private Members Bill, second reading. And since then, of course, there have been even more attempts. And I have witnessed with growing despair the vested interests in both the Commons and the Lords to conspire to stymie the progress for the reform agenda, include, including the latest, which admittedly I think the Nick Clegg Bill was probably ill thought out. Which is why I think... I've come to the conclusion that the Labour Party was right to call for a referendum 
on laws reform in the most recent debate, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But one of the reasons why I think a referendum is a good idea is because I'm confident that once the democratic and accountable arguments are put, wherever and whenever they are put, they will lead in one direction. For over a century, successive governments have attempted to fundamental reform of the House of Lords, and we have now reached what I think we could call a constitutional stalemate. The Commons would like a wholly and most or mostly elected House of Lords, and the House of Lords would like to be a wholly appointed House of Lords, and that's where they vote every time they, they get the chance to do that. So even though in the last election, the three main parties were committed to reform, and I thought we might have some real chance of seeing it, it's still the case that that constitutional stalemate exists. And I think the main points that we need to consider for democratic reform of the second chamber are this. In a modern world, surely, we can devise democratic accountability for our second parliamentary chamber. And I just wonder how we can face the world with emerging democracies and lecture countries about the need for democracy when half our parliament is a combination of leftover hereditary peers, mostly appointed by patronage and clerics from our established church. And frankly, I don't think it will do. It seems patronizing of us in this parliament to pretend that we have a model that of any kind and that by implication having elections to our second chamber will somehow lead to a defective parliament. I think we need to look around the world and see that Actually, many, many, many democracies manage with a second chamber elected, and they manage to govern their countries perfectly adequately. And I think it cannot be beyond our wit and wisdom in this country to do the same. And I would say that do we really believe, and the argument is made that we would lose all the expertise that we have in the House of Lords on our crossbenches, but do we believe that those peers on our crossbenches who makes clever and talented people would not find some other way to express their desire to do public service. Of course they would. Of course their talent and expertise would be available to us. And I do, not, I do believe that those ta clever and talented bishops, and I'm very pleased to see my friend, the retired bishop, Robert Retired Pro, we worked together um, in the Lords, indeed we did, but I don't believe that they would not be able to, and indeed would make their contribution to civic life if they were not in our second chamber. I think if we accept that our second chamber is the revising chamber of our parliament, it could and should be democratically accountable. What is required is a new settlement between the Lords and the Commons, a new balance, and I think hopefully it won't be called the Lords anymore anyway. I don't believe it's beyond the wits of the likes of Lord Norton to find their way through that problem. And I don't believe also that the Church of England should have seats as of right in our Parliament. The only other legislature I know where clerics have seats of right is that of Iran. I think that's probably not a model we would wish to, wish to follow. And they're there for very long-standing historical reasons. But it is, I don't think it's appropriate in a modern Parliament. And I really hope that the Church of England would reach that conclusion themselves as they modernise. Um, Although I have to say the vote against women bishops today doesn't, doesn't give me great. Um, and we are rightly concerned often with emerging democracies when they, they elect different religious groups, but at least they are elected. And I've worked with many bishops in the House over many years, and I just respectfully, respectfully say that I think that they have as much right to be there as I do, and that is actually none. We need to be elected. Some will say the Lords is important because it asks the government to think again from time to time and it defeats the government and that it's not political. Um, and this is, I think, it is true that in recent times that having, we have inflicted defeats on the government. And the last government, there were hundreds of defeats. Fewer now because the coalition actually has a political majority in the House of Lords. Um, but we have whips. We are political. Tomorrow we are discussing the secret courts uh, in the Justice Bill. We will be having a very hard-fought debate and we will be having what can only be described as a very political division, which we will both be taking part in. I think that one needs to remember that um, 
The government got defeated a handful of times during the Conservative uh, administration. That we needed to get rid of the hereditaries because it was uh, inherently unfair. We now need to look at the democratisation. And I believe political will is the issue here. If all the political parties agree that there is need to reform the House of Lords and democratise it, then why, why can it not happen? Which is why I think that the proposal the Labour Party made to have a referendum about it could unlock that, uh, that political deadlock, and I think we need to face it. So I, on that basis, I would ask you to support the motion. Thank you. In the introduction, it was mentioned we're talking about reform of the House of Lords. We're not. We're debating a motion about the election of the second chamber. They're actually different things. I support reform. I'm against election. Um, and it's noticeable as well that the House of Lords reform bill that came forward recently failed in the House of Commons, as indeed did the Parliament Number 2 bill in 1969. Now, I'm pleased to say I'm not going to say any of the things that Baroness Thornton claimed I was going to uh, say. Um, let me just say a few points words about second chambers and then get on to the arguments I want to adduce. We are unusual in our second chamber in this country, but not because it's appointed, because we've got one. Uh, most nations are unicameral, they're single chamber, uh, have single chamber legislatures. Only about a third of nations have uh, bicameral legislatures. Now, only about a third of those are wholly elected second chambers. Most are not. We're not unusual in having an appointed second chamber. And I want to make the case for our appointed second chamber. First, by explaining what's wrong with the sort of arguments one's just heard, what's wrong with the arguments for election. Having dealt with that, I then want to make the case for the House of Lords. So if you like, what's wrong with election? What's right with the current House? What's wrong with the arguments for election? Well, it strikes me there are two. One is they don't start from first principles. The focus is straight on the House composition, whether it should be elected or not. And that's looking at it through the wrong end of the telescope. Our starting point should be what type of constitution do we want for the United Kingdom? Within that, therefore, what role should Parliament play? It's only once you've established the role of Parliament that you can then determine what is the role of the Second Chamber. Anybody can come up with a scheme for how to elect uh, the membership of the Second Chamber, and goodness knows a great many people do. But that's the easy thing. The difficult thing is actually starting from first principles and starting from the basis of what we expect of our constitution. The second problem with the argument for election is this claim that it is somehow self-evidently the democratic option. It is not. Um, election does not necessarily equal uh, democracy. What democracy is about, and I'll take a quote to establish one of the definitions, I mean, at, at the heart of representative democracy, because we can't have direct democracy, we're too numerous, is the concept of accountability. It's the heart of how Smitter and Carl define democracy. A system of governance in which rulers are held accountable for their actions in the public realm by citizens, acting indirectly through the competition and cooperation of their representatives. In other words, democracy is not about the election of the parliament. It's about how you choose government and how those representatives that you choose to govern are then accountable to you. So at the heart of our system is accountability. And what that dictates in a democracy is an elected chamber. But one chamber is both necessary and sufficient. Because through that, you have what I call core accountability in this country. It is through the House of Commons, the elected chamber, that government is chosen. And democracy is about how we govern ourselves, through which government is chosen, and through which government is then accountable to the people. It's chosen through elections. It can be got rid of through elections. In Karl Popper's terms, election day is judgment day. A government can be thrown out. And it is accountable because it is responsible. Because under our system, there is just one body. That is the party or parties in government. That is responsible for public policy. So we know who is responsible, and therefore the body that can be held accountable for public policy. If you don't like it, we get rid of it. We know the body making public policy. We have the benefit of a second chamber, which I'll come on to, which does not then challenge that core accountability. The moment you start electing a second chamber, you undermine that accountability. 
because an elected chamber would be able to challenge the first. It wouldn't necessarily demand to be co-equal, but it would demand more powers than the existing house, and therefore be able to affect the outcomes of public policy, the principles, and not just the detail. And you would get outcomes to which the people could then not decide who was responsible for a particular outcome of public policy, because it would not necessarily be the policy of the elected government. So what you end up with is divided accountability. So election is not democratic if it actually provides for a mudging of the waters of people not being able to hold accountable those who are actually responsible for the output of public policy. So it is not necessarily the democratic option, nor is it necessarily the, will it produce a representative second chamber. There are different definitions of representation. In one sense, it is uh, people who act on behalf of another body. In another, it's people that are freely elected. Another, it is socially typical. Now, the Commons fits the first two. It doesn't fit the third. The Lords is not necessarily social, socially typical, but it is extremely diverse in its membership, including in terms of uh, religious diversity and indeed as a very large humanist organisation within the House. But it's through appointment that you can actually craft a more representative chamber in terms of the background from which people are drawn. Under our system, in the House of Commons, it tends to produce sort of identical MPs, predominantly they've been white, male, and middle class. Breaking that mould has proved extremely difficult. Appointment to a second chamber actually allows you to create a more diverse membership and to do it fairly quickly. So the arguments that election necessarily can be justified in terms of democracy or representativeness do not hold can make an argument. My point is that is that they are not self-evidently true. So they've got to come up with different arguments for election. So that's my argument against election, the argument that the second chamber should be elected. What is the argument then for the existing House of Lords? Basically, that it adds value to the political process by fulfilling tasks at the House of Commons doesn't have the time, the resources, or the political will to fulfill. Now, if you elect a second chamber, you're replicating the first. In effect, it's redundant, because in a unitary state like ours, people would be voting for members of the second chamber on exactly the same basis as they're voting for members of the first. We're not a federal state, so you wouldn't be voting in a separate capacity. So it would be uh, a redundant um, exercise. So what we have with our present second chamber it adds values because it's not just repeating or duplicating the first chamber. It adds value by fulfilling distinctive functions, legislative scrutiny. Most of the time the chamber's taken up with that in a way it is not in the House of Commons. The Commons can decide the ends of legislation and have the great debates about the great issues. The Lords gets down to the detailed scrutiny. If like we discuss the means, not the ends. We see if measures can be improved. And what estimates have been made, anyone I've seen, is that the Lords makes twice as much difference as the House of Commons in the detail of legislation. We don't challenge the principle because we see our role as complementary to the First Chamber, not as conflicting with it because we accept we're not elected. So we add value by engaging in legislative scrutiny, by engaging in debate, by scrutiny of public policy, including European Union policy, which takes up a great deal uh, of our resources and time. And we are able to do that. We can add value because of the composition of the House in two respects. The individual membership, it can be characterised as a House of experience and expertise, and that combination is important, and they are, but they are distinct. Uh, my experience is in higher education, my expertise is in constitutional matters. So the individual membership is extremely important because of who we can draw on to add value because of their backgrounds, distinguishable from the Commons, which increasingly is a chamber of career politicians. So the individual membership is important, but then so too is the political composition. No one party has a majority in the House. The Labour Party is the largest single grouping, but we've got over 20% of our members, the crossbenchers, drawn from no party political affiliation. Of course, they would go in the event of election. So they make the difference, because if they turn out in some numbers and vote disproportionately against the government, the government would lose. Normally we don't vote, we proceed by way of discourse, dialogue, and agreement. So the government's got to take the House seriously because it's not guaranteed it will get its way. It's got to persuade others in the House to take its point as well. So that's how we proceed. 
Um, it does make for a constructive environment. It's productive. We do make a difference to legislation, but without challenging the principles determined by the House of Commons. Our procedures facilitate us in doing that, um, and that enables to be an effective second chamber, complementary to the first. The House of Lords adds value. It's worth keeping. Election will not necessarily bring the benefits that have been claimed for it. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm happy to second the motion for an elected House of Lords. Um, I'd like to start tonight by talking about some of the arguments against uh, an elected House of Lords, a lot of the myths that were built up, particularly uh, in light of the bill, and then talk about why I'm for an elected House of Lords. Um, and I think there's three major myths that I'd like to tackle. Uh, the first of which is that, and Baroness Thornton touched on this, which is the idea that the House of Lords is somehow not a political chamber. It's depoliticized. Because it's not elected, it's because it's appointed. It, just, it doesn't operate in the sphere of party politics. And uh, this is clearly untrue. Uh, all three political parties, uh, major political parties in the House of Lords, all have whips operations in the Lords. And they're very effective. And votes often go down the whips line. Some would say that the whips in the Lords are more effective than the ones in the Commons. But that's another debate. Um, this makes sense because more than 40% of the people in the current upper house are drawn from a political background, so former MPs, MEPs, or councillors. Um, I'd like to talk about, the second thing I'd like to talk about is primacy. This was thrown around a lot while the bill was in motion, this idea that somehow if there was an, uh, an elected second chamber, uh, everything would ground to a halt, um, and the commons would somehow lose its legitimacy. Um, there are 29 elected bicameral systems in the world, um, the one I'd like to talk about is the Australian, uh, the Australian Senate, um, and they have, they have a way of dealing with deadlock, it's called a double dissolution, um, basically if they cannot, the both houses just end up in deadlock, um, both houses are dissolved. Uh, to give you some idea, that's happened six times in the history of the country, the last time was 25 years ago, so it doesn't happen very much, uh, it just, it, arguments tend to get resolved. I don't think we need that in the UK anyway because of the Parliament Act. I think the Parliament Act protects the House of Commons primacy very well. The final myth I'd like to address is um, this sort of idea that the House of Commons uh, has worked so well since the Magna Carta, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Um, I'd come on to uh, Blair's 99, 1999 reforms, which dramatically changed the House, I think. And not only the way it's composed, but I think to some degree the way it functions. Um, and I, I don't want to talk about whether Blair's reforms were good or bad. Um, I just think that, as other people have touched upon, it was, it was always intended as a stage one. So the idea was we, we introduce this change now, and then we move on. Because the sort of stage one, as, which is where we're still, we still are uh, 13 years later, is sort of unsustainable, and most of the bill's staunchest critics would admit this as well, um, that the current house as it stands is, is unsustainable. Reason being is that uh, a new government comes in, they're obviously going to want to redress uh, any balance issues, they're going to want to appoint peers so that they can, you know, get their, uh, get, get the bills through. Um, and then when they, so that, that adds to the House, and then what you do, what happens is, for instance, in 2015, if Labour were to get in, they would want to then add more peers, and it just goes on and on and swaps until you have over a thousand peers, um, which is where we seem to be heading. Um, in terms of where, why I'm for uh, an elected House of Lords, I think it really just comes down to a fundamental point, and I think whether you agree with me or not really comes down to this point, which is, do you believe that the people who make the laws should be elected. So do you think that the, the people who make the laws in a country should be democratically chosen? And I think that if, if that's not a strong point, then the rest of it, it's, it's sort of one of those things. It's either, either you, you fundamentally believe that or you don't. Um, and I think that's really what it all comes down to. Um, I think there are two major problems, two major obstacles going forward now that the House of Lords Reform Bill put forward by the coalition is dead. The two major problems facing changing the upper house. Um, I think one is that we unfortunately live in a very uh, anti-democratic age. I think people feel very distanced from representative democracy. Um, so it's hard to get a groundswell of public support around this. Um, 
it's sort of hard to argue for democracy for the sake of it, unfortunately. Um, polls suggest that people would prefer an elected House of Lords, but it's very low on their priority list. So it's basically the idea is, yes, we prefer an elected House of Lords, but we don't care that much. Um, so that's a problem. I'd say the other big obstacle is the current political situation. I think the, if you look at the three major parties, the Liberal Democrats are probably in a position of feeling like, well, they stuck their neck out once to try and do it. How much do they want to push constitutional reform next time out? Um, I think the Tories are very split on the issue. Uh, I think as we witnessed, there was a huge rebellion in the Commons that I'm sure they don't want to face again. <coughs> Sorry. Particularly over a, an issue that isn't of vital, you know, that wouldn't be seen as, as being um, of public interest. Uh, and I think Labour has its own sort of internal struggles on this as well. Um, so I think you know all three are basically divided. It's very difficult to say at this point what would be in any of the manifestos, which I think if you are pro-reform is slightly worrying. Um, I think it's, it's very difficult to get around the fact that if you want to introduce a, an elected House of Lords, you are basically going to have to try and get the legislation through one of the legislative arms. I mean, that it's the old turkeys don't vote for Christmas problem that uh, you come up time and time again. Why would the House of Lords pass a House of Lords reform bill? Um, it doesn't really make sense. And I think that the House of Lords, is, as it stands, is very useful for a lot of the parties. It solves a lot of um, problems that would have to be solved otherwise. Um, I think the only way that we're ever going to achieve House of Lords reform in Britain is if, basically, I think you'd need a prime minister who was absolutely passionate about changing the House of Lords, and was willing to not only stand up to his or her own peers, um, which in, let's face it, in a lot of instances is his or her own donors, um, and actually sort of have the guts to use the sort of ridiculousness of the current system against it, as it were. I mean, I think what you have to do is essentially say, well, I'm the Prime Minister, I can appoint anybody I like, I'm going to appoint 500 peers to get a House of Lords reform bill through. Um, I can't really see that happening any time <laughs> soon. <laughs> so um, I think, yeah, we're in a, we're in a pickle if, uh, if you're pro-reform. Um, I think that, uh, but I think that's why we come back to you guys. I think that um, the only other way we can get around it without the, 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 the pro-prime minister is public support. I think if it becomes more of a public issue and more people speak out against you know, the current system, I think we're getting there. Um, but in the meantime, I'm happy to second this motion and eager to hear your questions. Thank you. This House supports a wholly elected House of Lords. It depends, of course, on what you mean by elected. Elected simply means chosen, and it doesn't imply how or by whom. People are often surprised to know that diocesan bishops in the Church of England are elected, albeit by the somewhat restricted electorate of the cathedral chapter, and indeed at present on the sovereign's congé d'élire. But despite that somewhat eccentric example, it's not mere pedantry. There are a number of ways in which people are chosen for various positions. And it's obvious that this evening's debate is about choice by some form of popular ballot, with a not very hidden assumption that this gives a unique legitimacy to those so elected. And that seems to me to be a highly questionable assumption. Sometimes, election implies trust placed in an individual to act or decide as he or she judges wisely. Sometimes, it mandates people to speak or vote in a particular way. In some cases, such as the whipping system in the House of Commons, the theory and the practice do not coincide. In theory, we think that we vote for MPs to represent our interests as constituents. But in most important matters, their votes are dictated not by us, but by the party authorities. So things are not always as they seem. In this country, we do not elect our own government or prime minister. We, well, some of us at least, elect members of parliament. The queen then invites someone able to do so to form a government. And despite the, constitu the constituency theory, most electors knowing this, vote by the party of the candidate, which of course does raise huge questions about the legitimacy of a coalition. We're not discussing that this evening. We note too that MPs who fail to get re-elected sometimes get appointed by party leaders to the House of Lords. Well, 
It is, as Frankie Howard used to say, wicked to mock the afflicted. So I shall not gloat too much over last week's debacle over the elections for police commissioners. I think 14.25% in this part of the world. But I do think the implications must be long thought over. Low turnout has been a problem in elections for many years, but this time it seems to be choosing not to vote or choosing to attend a polling station and spoil a ballot paper has for many people been a seriously thought out choice. In other words, a democratic election by many people. Now I start here because although the issue of democratic legitimacy lies at the heart of the debate about the House of Lords, it's a much wider question than that. Governments are often, almost always, formed by parties which have less than 50% of the popular vote. This democratic deficit will not be redressed by having an elected second chamber. The House of Lords needs reform. Let me repeat that. The House of Lords needs reform. Questions about its size, its ability to discipline members, its role and its function are just important as questions about its, um, how people get to be members. Now, in my years in the House, I observed becoming increasingly like the House of Commons. The party whips become more and more dominant, and there is a growth in the partisan slanging so characteristic of what we still so delicately refer to as the other place. This is partly because of a larger number of former MPs in the House, and partly because of the increasing passion of successive governments to make more and more laws, many of which simply cannot or do not receive proper scrutiny or debate in the House of Commons. And so the role of the Lords as a revising chamber has therefore been weakened, and it spends more and more time acting as an overflow chamber for the Commons. So it's not surprising that many people ask for the Lords to have the same kind of legitimacy as the Commons. It's obvious if the function of the two houses is the same. If it is the same, however, the question is not so much about whether the Lord should be elected as whether we need a second chamber at all. So while I think that reform of the House of Lords is essential, and Baroness Thornton talked about 800 members, I mean, for issues about size, I've mentioned also questions of discipline, the ability of peers to resign. I mean, all sorts of these things seem to be no-brainers. But it does have to be set in the context of a wider reform of our so-called democratic institutions, which are really creaking at the moment. So I don't think this debate should precede agreement about what the Lords are for. At this moment, I still believe our democracy is best served with a second chamber whose functions are clearly distinguishable from the first and whose legitimacy is differently grounded. One fatal flaw in the recently abandoned bill was a proposal for a single 15-year term. Part of the point of elections, as commonly understood, is that those who choose their representatives can unchoose them next time round. The 15-year proposal, while not unreasonable in itself, on the basis you can choose people whom you trust and leave them to get on with it, falls unhappily between the two stools. It gives the illusion of electoral accountability without any substance. If the basis of the argument for an elected House of Lords is there's a kind of democratic legitimacy that comes from election and accountability, those proposals failed an essential democratic test. As all this affects our constitution, it's surely too important just to be left to the government of the day. I'm among those who favor constitutional arrangements not reducible to a single code. It's of course simplistic to describe the British constitution as unwritten, it's part written and part unwritten, and in neither case is it to be found in a single place. In another context, this is what's referred to as dispersed authority. Or to put it another way, it's not good for too much power to be concentrated in a single place. One advantage of our present arrangements is that non-politicians have a role to play in governance. The House of Lords is, of course, not to be justified on that basis alone. But just as it is good that the electoral cycle brings a number of non-career politicians into the House of Commons, the great, the great value is added by peers who are members of the Lords whose expertise in other areas than that of party politics. Society is bigger 
than its governing classes, and, and democracy requires that the widest range of people possible have a voice, especially those whose voices may be unpopular or politically incorrect by prevailing standards. Democracy demands that minorities likely to miss out on a simple electoral system can be heard. I am therefore clear that a wholly elected upper house would be a dangerous threat to British democracy and would further reduce the already low esteem in which the vital and noble profession of politics is regarded in this country. It will of course be a considerable challenge to devise an appointment system that will command popular confidence, but I'm sure that's the way to go and that's the way we're going to get effective reform of the House of Lords. Thank you. Well, we think we've done it. On the substantive motion, we support a wholly elected House of Lords. This House voted 19 in favour, 29 against, with six abstentions. And on the, as it were, popular motion, there were 48 votes in favour, none against, and five abstentions. So, thank you very much.